called The Challenge of Humanism. Introduction. Satan has presented five religious packages to mankind, all based on the lies that Eve accepted in the Garden of Eden. He sells these lies in many forms, but they're still basically the same lies. The five most common packages are humanism, evolution, the new age, cults, and counterfeit religions. And we'll cover each one of these topics in this unit. The Bible says we're involved in a spiritual battle between two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Within these two kingdoms are two very different value systems. Christianity, which states that God and his word are truth, and the other value system, humanism, where there is no God and every person needs to set their own values. Many Christians are losing ground to Satan because they do not know what these challenging packages are and what they themselves believe and stand for. The battle lines are drawn. Both kingdoms have a stake in influencing young hearts and minds for the next generation. There was a point in my life, and it's Susan that's talking, when I saw clearly that there really were only two paths to life, Father God and the one who would replace God, the Antichrist. So there's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. So we're going to cover these five areas. And again, it's a big job to try to cover in two hours. Tonight we're going to focus on humanism and evolution. I'll talk to you about humanism, and then Daniel will come and talk about evolution, partly because he's been a math science teacher, so he actually taught evolution in the high school. So he has a good overview of what evolution is all about. And then what we as Christians, this, the opposite viewpoint of what creation is all about. So he's going to talk to you about that. So we have five main areas we're covering. Humanism, evolution tonight. Next week, the New Age. The week after, cults and counterfeit religions. And those are five basic religions. And we'll define in a minute why we call them religions. But they're based on the lies that Adam and Eve believed and took in when they were in the garden. Do you remember what they were just... What, what was it Adam and Eve believed in the garden? What did they get from the serpent? He told them they would be like God. Keep going. Their eyes would be open. And they would know good and evil. Yes. So those, those promises are what each of those five different counterfeit packages are based on. Capital B. Jesus must be the focus. Jesus must be the focus. When Jesus was talking to his disciples and the people who wanted to follow him in Luke 6, 46, he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Many people today say, Lord, Lord, but still choose death and refuse to obey. Instead, their focus is on earning their own salvation, of doing something to assure God's favor. However, these works are not what he asks of us. So we need to really ask ourselves, is his word really our focus? Does our private belief match our public life? We need to bring every area of our life under his lordship. So in other words, does what I believe and what I do at home match what I profess as a Christian out in the open? Or what I have out in the open, does that match my belief system that I carry out at home? And most of us, when we get behind the, the doors and the walls of our house, we sort of throw off a lot of masks, a lot of pretensions, and we are, we just live. So the question is, is what I'm at home, does that match what I preach and what I teach and what I talk about out in public? Now, sorry it's a bit warm in here. We can't turn that heat up or we can't turn it down. So if you get too warm, we'll just open the door in the back. <coughs> How are you? It's pretty warm? Okay pretty warm up here. It must be all the hot air that's flowing around. <laughs> Capital C, the challenge to the Christian faith. The challenge to the Christian faith. It's obvious that our underlying assumptions on the meaning of life will greatly influence everything that we hold as truth. Our biases determine our motives for everything we do. Therefore, we need to examine our basic assumptions. So in other words, what I really believe in my heart is going to determine how I live. And we talked about that a little bit last week. If I believe that Jesus is coming back and there's going to be a judgment, will that affect my personal life? 
You betcha. If I believe there is no God, therefore there is no judgment, I'm going to live that way as though there is no accountability. So it's just me and my conscience or the people that I love around me, but there's no accountability. So it's going to affect my life. Satan challenges the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith. The following are some areas that the enemy is trying to credit. Actually, these are the six basic fundamentals of the Christian faith. One, the creation by a loving, personal God who still wants to be involved in our life. Does the Bible teach that? Definitely. The inspiration of the scriptures by the Holy Spirit, the Bible, is his infallible word to us, including God's view of the end time events. So if I don't believe that the Bible is really from God, that's going to affect the way that I live as well, isn't it? The God-inspired virgin birth of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. The need for an atoning substitutionary work of Christ. Grace versus law. Grace versus works. Faith versus law. The literal bodily return of Christ to earth and his kingdom's rule. And then six, the coming judgments by a righteous God. Those are the six foundations for the Christian faith that we hold. Now, every single one of those six is challenged by humanism. It's challenged by evolution. It's challenged by the New Age. It's challenged by the false cults and the false re- and the counterfeit religions. So those are the six basic foundations. So as we go through this, um, those are the six that I'll be contrasting with what the humanists believe, what the evolutionists believe. Any questions on those six? Are we in agreement on the six? Any that you disagree with? That must mean we're Christians. (laughs) All right, humanism defined, capital D, humanism defined. Humanism believes a religious theory that permits an explanation of man's origin without God, and that's by evolution. Thus, mankind, not God, is in control of their destiny. So humanists have a religious theory. And we give a definition for religion down in the box. Religion means a cause, principle, or system of belief held to with ardor and faith which attempts to explain the origins of life, the purpose of life, or the way life has developed. As such, both secular humanism and evolution are classified as religions. An interesting concept that someone that believes in evolution or in humanism, that's actually a religion to them because it attempts to define how life got started. It attempts to explain the purpose of life. And that's the definition of what a religion is. The humanist religion leaves man free and unaccountable to God. They teach that there is not now nor ever has been a supreme being. There is no personal God who is interested in the affairs of man. And that's one of the basis of humanism. Now notice we're not talking about humanitarianism. That's completely different. But this is humanism. Two, humanists hold the view that man is basically good. Their goals in life are self-actualization, self-determination, and self-indulgement. Humans only need the perfect environment to prove their worth. If left to their own devices without interfering laws, morals, or religion, humans would have a perfect society. Now, is that true? So, in other words, that's where the belief comes from that a baby is perfect, that they come into the world a clean slate. There's absolutely nothing written on the slate. And therefore, what makes them evil, what makes them good or bad? What determines whether one child turns out uh, with bad behavior tendencies and one child turns out good? What determines that? Society Society and particularly the parents, the family that they grow up in. Now, contrast that to what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? Were we born perfect? No. In fact, we're born in sin and iniquity. So it's not society that corrupts us. In fact, you can see this in a lot of the child-raising theories and philosophies today. If couples believe that their child is basically good, and so they really don't need to direct too much of what they do, that eventually they'll learn and they'll behave themselves, and eventually they'll learn to control their own own actions, 
then they pretty well just let them go and do what they want to do. Certainly cur curb any environmental problems, but a child is left pretty much to do what they want to do. Can you see that in society today? Yeah, it's a very strong philosophy in child rearing. Versus what the Bible says is that the child that is, because we're not born perfect, the child needs to be what? Trained, that's right. Train up a child in the way he'll go. So they need to be trained. They need to be socialized. They need to be taught how to behave in society. It doesn't come natural to them. So if you have the one philosophy where you're training your child, and I'm not going to get into the debate about spanking or you know, all that sort of stuff, but if you're training your child in a godly way and the humanist comes along and say, well, all you have to do is just take off all your rules and regulations, your child will become good by itself, it's going to cause a conflict, isn't it? So here's another way where, where Christians are here and humanists are over here. So it's a man's best interest to find the good life in the here and now. In other words, do your own thing. Because if there is no God, you might as well do your own thing. So humanists hold that view that human beings are basically good. They just have to be allowed to be good. Capital E, the basic beliefs of humanism. So here are the basic six, seven, eight, basic seven views of the humanists, what they're after in the world today. And as we go through this, I want you just to sort of think about how well they're doing, how well are they carrying out their goals in today's world. Well, number one, the basic belief of humanism is in evolution, that humans are an advanced species that humans are just an advanced species. Mankind is the result of evolution. The emphasis is on improvement through science, understanding the social and cultural forces which have made mankind to what they are today. So to the humanist, science and technology have become the new gods, that the answer is out there somewhere. We just have to keep looking long enough to find it. And so if we put all the time and energy and effort into science, mankind will be perfected that way as well. Now, it's interesting with all the advancement in science and medicine. I heard one, people, one, one doctor say that there's more sick people today in the world than there's ever been before. Even with all the advancements in the medical science field, there's still more sick people today partly because we're not getting down to the roots of the problem. Stresses and strains and hurry, busy, busy, busy is causing a lot more illness today than it would have 200 years ago. And we're also um, taking on the renewal of the people. Yes. More yes, that's a good point too. So God has restored the healing ministry back into the church more than ever before. So people are praying for healing more than ever be before, but there's still more sickness and more need for healing than ever before. Mm -hmm. Two, humanists hold anti-God attitudes. Anti-God attitudes. Humanism denies the deity of God, the inspiration of the Bible, or the deity of Jesus Christ. The Bible account of creation is dismissed. In fact, it's Bless you. It's dismissed as a fairy tale, a myth, um, stories that were just handed down by word of mouth through the generations and that they're often wrong, that people got them wrong, but they're the myths. That the su survival of the human race depends on mankind alone, as there is no supernatural creator God or a coming judgment. There is no life after death, no supernatural level, no angels and no demonic world. So the humanist denies all supernatural no no supernatural world out there there is no god we're a product of evolution so our our survival is in our own hands three that morals have also evolved so our values of right and wrong our standards have also evolved with humanism there is no absolutes no consistent moral right or wrong. One's amoral or a amoral views are learned from human experience. Our actions will depend on the situation that we're in. 
human reasoning becomes God as situational ethics replaces absolute ethics. One decision might be right one time and wrong the next. And how does that compare to what the Bible says? <coughs> that there is a standard of right and wrong and that God is the judge. And that murder one time is murder the second time. And that stealing one time is stealing the second time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if it's a do-your-own thing, yes, if it's a do-your-own thing situation, um, you know, particularly when sexual ethics are involved, going to bed with the guy might be right in one situation, but wrong in another situation. Abortion might be right in one situation, but wrong in another situation. So the situation depends on the... The ethics depend on what's happening in the situation. Four, technology and science have become the ultimate provider. The ultimate provider. Research and science becomes an alternative to religion and morals, another form of God. Genetic planning is seen to provide the perfect human being, creating a new re race of people for the new world. And that's a very hot potato right now, the cloning debate that's going around. You know, they've certainly done it for sheep. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, moral issues that haven't been considered in the whole thing. You know, some of the cloning <laughs> debate is, is using the embryos. And if, if science and humanists say that a human being isn't a human being until it begins to develop a heart and begins to develop... Um, at a certain point along the line, that before that it's not a human being. It's just living tissue, but it's not a human being. And therefore, cloning and using all these embryos that have been started, they save one in a hundred, and the rest of them they just destroy and let go. Now, what's the moral implications in that from God's point of view? There's committing murder. Because once that life is started, then that's a human life. So there's a lot of moral debating going on right now about the whole thing. Yes, yes, there would be no, no admitting that there's something greater than mankind. Mm. Although it's interesting, there are inroads into that whole area, particularly if you've got a, an evolutionist, there are certain discussions that you can get into that helps them see some of the blinded areas that they have. But again, when you're working with people that, that are caught in all this stuff, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is judge them. In fact, we put in a section over here on, well, I guess we didn't on this. In the New Age one, next week we put in a section on how do you reach people in the New Age. But certainly not through judgment and condemnation. It's knowing where they're coming from, knowing what their terms mean. I found that in, in talking with New Age people, you can be talking about the spirit you can be talking about all kinds of things and they'll be nodding their head, yes, they're in agreement and they're right with you. But come to, to basic down what terms mean, they're saying completely different when they talk about the spirit than what we're talking about the spirit. To them, the great cosmic energy source is the great spirit, an impersonal force out there that you can't have any relationship with. But there are ways to reach humanists. There are ways to reach evolutions. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He analyzes everything. That's right. Yes. Probably the the best way, and I'm not sure if Daniel's going to get into this, but the best way to help people like that is just to tell, give them your testimony. Uh, you know that God has changed you and he's worked in your life because they can't argue with your own personal testimony. And they can say, I suppose they could say you're deceived and 
warped and yeah yes number five the schools and the universities are breeding grounds schools and universities Humanism has a stronghold on the institutions found in today's society. Schools, universities in particular, have accepted humanism as their major building block, block of truth. The aim is to undermine God's foundation for a healthy society, the family, the church, and the nation. So if Satan can destroy the family, then that's tearing apart the very fabric of the society. Is the family being destroyed today? Yes, yes, very definitely, a war against the family. Six, lifestyle is based on personal and civil rights. Humanism dismantles absolute morals. Instead, they present, first of all, the right for sexual freedom, free love, promiscuity, sex with children above the age of 10, premarital and extramarital sex, birth control, homosexuality, and pornography are encouraged. Parental and church values are challenged. Individual rights are elevated over the marriage covenant, parental or family rights. And can you see that happening? You see the flood that's coming into the media, into the movies, into TV, into magazines. It's almost a hyper-sexuality, <laughs> as though sex, sex was the most important thing in the whole world. So it's a hyper-sexuality. And so if, if anything goes, anything goes. I was teaching sex education up at Hillsville High School when we first came out. This is going back, no, this would be going back almost 20 years ago. And I used to have little year sevens come in and know absolutely nothing about menstruation, absolutely nothing about how their bodies worked. Within the next six years before we left the teaching profession, there was a flood of dolly magazines, TV articles, all kinds of things. And I'd have year sevens come in that knew as much about sexuality as the year twelves did. It was just an absolute flood of sexual material that the kids had gotten a hold of. Some of them, the parents didn't know they had a hold of it, but they knew just as much about birth control and you know, petting and venereal disease and on and on and on and on and on as the year 12s did. It's pretty staggering, little seven year, seventh year, seventh year sevens, knowing all about these sort of things. Pretty amazing. And not only knowing about them, but asking for the chance to, to have some experience and, you know, wanting to know more about it. So the right to sexual freedom. Second, abortion on demand, including young teenagers. Killing of infants, euthanasia, and suicide are all acceptable actions. Now, hopefully suicide hasn't gotten to the point where it's, it's completely accepted, probably because of the tragedy that it, that it causes. But suicide among the older members of society isn't even, you know, it happens a lot, and we don't even, a lot of people don't even have that much awareness that that's happening a lot. So certainly suicide among the older generation is getting more and more accepted. Than euthanasia, <laughs> killing infants like abortion. Mm. Yeah. C. Gambling, decriminalization of prostitution and drug use are encouraged as this allows people to choose their own lifestyle. Be lenient to criminals as they are victims of their life circumstances. How often do we see that as a slant in in some of the newspaper reporting or, or in um, you know, some of the crimes that are happening, people trying to understand why they did what they did, looking at their parents, looking at the abuse that they had, rather than holding each person accountable for what they've done, holding us accountable for our actions. So be lenient to criminals. Next, the abolition of all sex roles and differences between male and female equality of age, sex, race, and culture. Now some of that we as Christians would say, yeah, that's right. There ought not to be discrimination between age, sex, race, and culture. So some of this we'd agree on. But it's the method of how you get there that the Christian and the humanist disagree on. So an abolishment of all sex roles and differences between males and females. Can you see that happening in our society? Yeah. Sometimes a, a young one walking down the street, I look at Daniel and I say, male or female? And it's a big question mark because the, the blurring of the sex roles is happening. 
Now, probably anything that God has said, like the family, marriage, sex roles, uh, sex differences between males and females, the enemy is out to destroy. And that's happening more and more. Unisex stuff is coming in. Next one, the removal of national sovereignty, patriotism under a free enterprise system, including disarmament, resulting in the loss of independent state control. This one we haven't seen a whole lot of, although I would suspect some of the, some of the newspaper stories that we're getting, that this is one of the underlying things that is coming through and we aren't hearing it in the newspapers and what's happening. If enough situations happen and the UN starts moving in, what's happening to individual states' rights? They're being surrendered to the UN, to the National Peacekeeping Force, just to keep the peace in that area. And it's interesting looking at the newspaper how many countries that that is happening. It's happening more and more. Now, the humanists say, would say, yep, good, good. We need peace in the world. And the, the Christian would say, yeah, we need peace in the world. But are we ever going to have peace until Jesus comes back? No. In fact, one of the Bible predictions is that people are going to be saying, peace, peace, peace. That's what they're going to want in the end days. And there will be no peace. F, under the banner of ecology, humanism plans to take control over the environment and the use of the environment to create a new world order. So even ecology and the environment is under the humanism microscope. Well, how well are the humanists doing in our world today? Pretty well. Pretty well. Yeah. It's almost shocking how well they're doing. In fact, I, I try very hard not to be a, a conspiracy uh, buff, you know, follow all the latest conspiracies. But I am convinced that this latest thing with the GST, that there's more to it than what we know. I mean, here... Our prime minister is willing to sacrifice his whole political career for something that looked like suicide, but yet he stuck with it, and he stuck with it, and he stuck with it. So since Australia is one of the countries that is, uh, has been designa designated as the experimental society for the cashless society, I would suspect that there's more going on behind the scenes than what we have any idea. Very possible. Seven, the development of a new one world order. The book is quite. No. The development of a new one world order. The aim of the secular humanistic movement is to establish a new world order and a new race of evolved people. This includes a one monetary system, a worldwide bank, a cashless society aiming to redistribute the world's wealth. Is that happening today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. more and more, more and more. The, the cashless society going to the credit card, and they're experimenting with the little chip that you put under your skin, so you won't even need a credit card, you won't even need cash someday. Just go in, do a scan, and it automatically comes out of your bank account. So a one monetary system. And I heard a really interesting little story, and if I can remember it, because I meant to have it here tonight. This is the story of the ants and the grasshoppers. One day, the grasshoppers of the world got together, and they decided to take the ants to the world insect court to prove that the ants were controlling the world and that they needed their share, that they were being denied their share of resources, their share of uh, living environment, their share and that they were being destroyed year after year after year, and it was the ants' fault. Okay, so you got the picture? All right, so here the grasshoppers present their solicitors to the world insect court, and they try to predict, they try to portray the society that they live in where the ants have all the resources. The ants have the best nests. The ants have the best food. The ants have the best organization. The ants have it all, and they want their share. So now it's the ants' turn to come and talk to the world insect court. And what do they say? What do you think the ants say? What's their defense? There's more of us than you. Mm, perhaps, unless you're in a locust plague. Okay. Keep going. What else would they say? Why would the ants be so much more superior in one sense than the grasshoppers? Ants work together. Ants work together. 
not only they work together, but sometimes they work from sunup to sunup. So they're in an industrious lot. So they go out and, and find the resources, they bring the resources back, they store up food for the winter time, they take care of their own so that in time of famine they've got food somewhere else. So what do you think the verdict of the, of the World Insect Court is? Do, do you think they'd rule in the favor of the, the uh, grasshoppers or in the favor of the ants? What would the judge say to the grasshoppers? If you worked like the ants, you'd probably have the society and the structure and the resources that the ants do. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, where am I headed with this? Uh -huh. There should be more ants and more grasshoppers. <laughs> <laughs> we need more ants in the world. Well, it's tipped over the balance now. Which countries was mostly the, the uh, had most of the wealth in the world? Okay, that's, that's the oil companies, but let's leave them aside because that's only within the last 20 years that they've taken on the wealth. Where was most of the wealth 20 years ago? The Western cultures, the Christian Western cultures. So most of the wealth was in um, Britain, England, the U.S., Australia, Canada, most of the areas where there was a solid Christian foundation, a work ethic, so that people worked for their living. They went out and, and yes, they, they may have harvested the mines and the forests unwisely, but they went out and got the wealth from the land and built up the wealth. And where were the poorest countries? Nations such as India, that, that whose religion is very much a karma-based religion? What do I mean by that? What's a karma? What's your karma? What's that idea all about? It's a, yeah, it's a spiritual belief, yes. It's a belief in reincarnation. So if I've done something bad in my past life and I've been born a cripple, my karma is to be that cripple so that I can learn my lesson from that. So there, there isn't many organizations that are going to come around and help me as a cripple because it's my karma. So what would that sort of philosophy do to a nation? Destroy it, that's right. Very fatalistic sort of philosophy. That we're here because it's our reincarnation. And if I'm born into the higher classes, into the higher caste system, it's because I did something good in my lifetime in the past. And so I deserve to be born into the higher caste system. So the higher caste system didn't have that much to do with the lower caste system. So what sort of productivity could there be in a country that believed that? Probably not a lot. The rich would get richer, and the poor would probably get poorer. That's why they don't have a good social... Mm -hmm. That's right. So this, the social caring structure came through the Christian ideal that everybody is equal worth, the dignity of mankind, the importance of mankind. Each individual is worth something in God's sight. It's a Christian ideal. It's not a Hindu ideal. It's not a, you know, in any of the other religions don't have that as an ideal like the Christian nations do. So a lot of the Christian nations have put a lot of work and effort yeah, sometimes unwisely, but have put a lot of work and effort into building up their culture. Now, if, if other countries get together and say, well, Australia has more than its fair share of wealth in the world, and we want some of it, what's going to happen? It's probably going to be a big clash. Mm. Okay, so the, the grasshoppers of the world are going to start demanding their fair share of the wealth of the world. Right. Food for thought. Just toss it around. Food for thought. Susan, yep. That's right. So the demand that third world countries shouldn't be held accountable for their debt. And you look at a lot of the third world countries, where is the money going to? 
yeah, into war or you know corruption or whatever. So the money they're getting money, but they've spent it in such a way that it hasn't improved the whole society. Now that's a generalization because in some countries they have. But yes, that's a good example of some of the third world countries saying, well, we shouldn't have this debt. Now, certainly the proportion of the debt probably needs to be looked at, and certainly the, the money-hungry banking system that is pushing the debt, that probably needs to be looked at. And we're not saying that that is Christian or what Jesus would want to have happen. But yes, that's a good example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so just a little glimmer of where I'm at, what I'm talking about. Well, that's where we started, too. Is that really good? There's one or two African nations that were... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a big push. Yeah, a big push. And, mm-hmm. Well, the last, the last time they had the, the meeting of the, the banking system, and where was it, in the States, in New York, the whole whole convention was upset by a lot of people protesting that the third world countries ought not to have to pay the debt that they owed. And so there was big movement, big big uproars, big demonstrations for that very thing. Mm -hmm. But as you start thinking about it, you'll see other areas where that's happening around the world as well. But again, it's it's an attempt to dismantle the Christian views that have gotten that country to where they are and the, the value sometimes, yeah, unwisely, but they've gotten the Christian country where it is. Okay, any other comments? So a one-world monetary system, cashless society. Second, a one-world religious system. So the humanists will push the line, be tolerant of many paths because they all lead to God. The new religion will oppose the traditional moral beliefs, moral religions of the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. It involves a deliberate attempt to remove God and eliminate any outdated moralistic stand. So we as Christians would be labeled as outdated, moralistic. What's some other words that humanists would apply to us? Um, Straight-laced. On and on and on. There's a whole... Well, sometimes Christians call each other that too, and it fits the mark. But yeah, because we have a moralistic view that there is a God and that God requires laws, it requires a, an accountability, the humanist view, if there's no God, they would see us as very narrow-minded. Now, it's interesting that the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, what connection is there between those three? Yeah, that's true. Biggest Christian movements in the world. It's interesting that all three of those are looking for a Messiah to come back. What's the similarity? Mm-hmm. They have, um, one, one main place in the old yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. June, you're a couple of steps ahead of me. Why? Why? Ju- exactly. So what have Muslims got to do with Christians? What do they believe? Yeah. Okay, yeah, but that's sort of the after... Yes, they claim themselves that, that they're the children of Abraham. Mm-hmm. Do the Jews claim that they're children of Abraham? Yeah, and what about Christians? What's the connection there? Through Jesus. That's right. So all three of those religions have a common foundation, and they all three believe in one God. So there's a lot of moralistic teachings that we th- we three religions would hold that the humanist is trying to do do away with. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, you see it, and yeah, sometimes it's getting into the Christian church. Yeah, yeah. Well, you look around at a lot of the the World Council of Churches. That's getting stronger and stronger and stronger, is is teaching that, and actually open to the fact that that well now maybe maybe the Hindus have a point in here, and maybe we ought to be listening to the Hindus as well, and that all paths lead to God. So you can believe anything you want except for the traditional Christian, the traditional Jew, or the traditional Muslim. So anything goes, anything goes. 
C, a one world education system will be established. Can you see the, that almost beginning to take shape here in Australia as the government takes over more and more state controlled education? And in some ways, remember, that's a good thing. And to some degree, we Christians would say, well, there needs to be higher standards. Children need to be taught to read before they get to, to year five. Yeah, and we'd agree on that. But this is going to be a one world education system. It's already like the International Baccalaureate. Mm -hmm. It's internationally recognized around the world. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to exert their influence at whatever country that they're in. Yeah. Then a one world government system will overcome any single nation views. Disarmament is the key. The resulting dictatorship will be, be a form of socialism as state-controlled workers' paradise. Remember what we talked about last week when the, the uh, Antichrist and you know, all the end-time events begin to happen? This is going to fit right into the establishment of the, the Antichrist to take over the control of the government, the religion, the education system, to have one Messiah that's going to step in. It's just setting the scene for, for um, the takeover of the Antichrist. Interesting, eh? By restructuring the government, the church, the education system, the media, and all other organizations, the humanists hope to control the world, and the foundations for society will be changed. Now, about this time, I usually get people say, well, Susan, this is a bit pessimistic. How can you say that this is really happening? So turn over to Appendix A. The Humanist Manifesto, published in 1933. These are the aims of the humanist organization, the, the underlying foundation. One, religious humanist universe was self-existent, not created, that it's a result of a continuous program, a continuous process. Um, go through, um, where am I up to? Un number five, humanists assert that the nature of the universe depicted by modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. Convinced that the time has passed for theism, What's theism? <coughs> Belief in God. Belief in God. One God. De deism, so that hits some of the other um, religions where there are many, many gods. Modernism, several varieties, sorry, yeah, and several varieties of new thought. Religion consists of those actions, purposes, experiences which are humanly significant. Um, here, let me keep going down here. These are the basic things that they're following. Ten, uh, belief in the supernatural gets chucked out. Um, satisfactions of life. Where are we? Up to uh, 13. Humanist maintains all associations, institutions exist for the fulfillment of human life. Intelligent evaluation, transformation, transformation, Control direction for such association is the purpose and the program of humanism. Religious and communal activities must be reconstituted as rapidly as experience allows in order to function effectively in the modern world. And this is 1933. These are the goals that are being set out. I'll leave that with you. leave that with, with you. So that's the Humanist Manifesto. That's what is being used as the criteria for what's happening in this day and age. Now, the number eight, the Humanist Strategies to take over teaching institutions, allowing the power of the state to control what is taught, which, of course, will be secular humanism, denying the teaching of any traditional Christian values to the young. A deliberate moral vacuum will be created so a self-centered value structure develops all without an awareness of God. 
So if the next generation is not taught that there is a God and that God has moral laws, it's like it creates a moral vacuum. And into that vacuum, it's a do-what-you-will sort of lifestyle. Is that happening today? Very much happening today. Now, the next goal is to train the next generation to be molders of public opinion, passing on the ideas of humanism, the use of the financial resources they generate in their professions to redistribute human views, humanist views. Three, place a new generation of humanists into the government, the law courts, and the media, pass laws favorable to humanist calls, and to persuade the majority of people to follow their program. One of the biggest complaints by police officers is that they arrest someone, they bring them to jail, they bring them to the courts, and what happens in the court systems? A lot of times they set them free. Or because the jails are so full, the judges don't want to send one more person to a crammed space, and so they're very lenient on them, particularly young offenders, very lenient. On sometimes on just a, a technicality, I can understand how police would be very, um, you know, get very disillusioned with the law courts, the court system that's happening. I can understand how you can get evidence the wrong way. I mean, if it's evidence, it's evidence. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can get it. Yeah. yeah. Or if public opinion is formed against you, you're you're guilty before you're even started in the trial. Believing the lie that atheism offers the rational excuse to do what you will, to live life without accountability, ignoring the coming judgment. It's the perfect philosophy to hide the self-centered me of the fallen nature of mankind. The humanist views allow rebellion against God, against parents and authority. It gives them the rationale to do every kind of evil and to not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who do them. So a lot of what's behind the humanist thinking is it gives them a chance to do what they want to do because they want to do it. And if they convince themselves that there is no judgment, they can do what they want to do because that's what they want to do. If Jesus foresaw man's attempts to rule without God, and this we have to hang on to as well. It's not a surprise to God that all this is happening. Jesus foresaw man's attempts to rule without God. You could just look back to the seeds in the Garden of Eden. That's what Adam and Eve were going to try to do. Certainly that's what Lucifer was going to try to do. The goals of secular humanism should not surprise us. The Lord Jesus Christ predicted this decline in the end times. And we said that, uh, well, some of them, that man, man would be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, disobedient to authorities, and so on and so on. And then there's quite a few different verses in there that talk about the end times. We're not going to have a chance to open them up and get into them. Other writers describe this time as well. The book of Revelations preview, previews this time period, especially Revelations 13, 7 to 18, with the rise of the beast and the Antichrist. Um, we've got a minute. How about someone grab that verse, Revelation 13, 7 to 18? This is one of the things that I miss doing is being able to get the Bible out and compare it with the scriptures. So Revelation 13, 7 to 18. Bless you. Okay, yep, Maria. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and the authority was given to him over, over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads the captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. He is, he is, the, he is with the patience and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns that like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he can even make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So the stage is being set for the, the one that comes to do all the mighty miracles. And since three major religions are expecting the Antichrist, expecting the Messiah, 
it would be very easy for someone to present, begin to present themselves on the world scene that does miracles, that matches the prophecies enough that the, the, those who aren't aware, those who are just going along with the whole flow of everything and aren't questioning what's happening and reading the Bible, will just believe that it's the Christ, the Messiah. And then that person will begin to do more miracles and suck more and more people in. So the Lord knew all of this was going to be happening. It's not a not a surprise to him at all. Mm-hmm. Well, when they begin to see some supernatural signs being done, they'll be persuaded that some of it will be. So some of them will change the fence and go from the humanists into the new age. Some of the lines between the humanists and the new age are a bit blurred anyhow. This this would be the 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 group that's called that are the certified humanists if you want to put that label on them so this is what the the ones believe that don't have any relationship with god they don't believe there is a god good any other comments g conclusion and homework Humanism and evolution appeal to the underlying old nature of rebellion and pride. It emphasizes the deception that mankind has the answer to life's problems. As Paul reminds us, men love the darkness as their deeds are evil. Many of the humanist goals seem very worthwhile at first glance. However, the methods, the motives, and the lawlessness of humanism will destroy mankind. It's impossible for secular humanism, evolution, and Christianity to survive side by side in society. Only when the true king of kings replaces the darkness with himself will secular humanism disappear. So can you see how, how completely opposite the humanist is from the Christian views? It really is opposite. And they hold a lot of things that we could not even begin to, to agree with. And so we're going to be held as narrow-minded, uh, rigid, unwilling to compromise when the rest of the world is saying, well, just anything goes. Everybody's beliefs are important. And there is no God, so there is no one path. All paths lead to whatever you think is God. Any comments or any other questions? <coughs> Okay, let's go take our coffee break. When we come back, Daniel's going to talk to us about evolution. Let's go on with uh, part two of tonight. And um, tonight, this, this part's the challenge of evolution. Introduction. Creation is a fact. There was an eyewitness called God. He's told us how he did things in the written record of the Bible. Evolution is only a theory because no scientist saw how life began. Science cannot prove things unseen, unobserved, or unrecorded by present witnesses. Both evolution and creation attempt to deduce things about the past from the belief systems of today. B. God made living things reproduce after their kind. God made living things reproduce after their kind. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And that's out of Genesis chapter 125. Here we see that God made all kinds of animals true to their own kind. A shark did not have a cat as its offspring, and they still don't today. God developed DNA so that living things would be born with the same blueprint as the parents. God is a God of order, not chaos. C. Evolution defined. <clears throat> evolution defined. Evolution is the supposed development of complex multi-celled organisms from simple single-celled living things. This occurs by random, that is, not intelligent processes involving extremely long periods of time. As mutations occur, Natural selection causes them to succeed. Thus, one kind slowly de- <coughs> develops into another kind. Well, anyways, that's what evolution claims. D, what's in dispute? <coughs> uh, 
what is in dispute. There is no disagreement today between evolutionists and creationists that a male and female fish will have offspring that will grow up into fish and not oranges. What is in dispute is whether fish will always be fish or become something else. Evolutionists say fish became amphibians, which in turn ev evolved into reptiles, and then reptiles evolved into mammals. This is totally contrary to what God said happened in the days of creation. Of course, most evolutionists would also claim that there is no God and never was. Some Christians, theists, they're called theists, who compromise with God's word, believe that God first created life, but also believe that evolution then developed animals and man, uh, just like evolution claims. Okay, going on, E, creation and evolution compared. Creation and evolution compared. Creation and evolution both attempt to explain how life developed into such amazing ver diversity. Following are some comparisons between the theory of evolution and the biblical fact of creation. Uh, number one, under creation, the earth was created by God in three days, according to Genesis. Evolution says that earth coalesced from debris from the Big Bang or some other similar theory. Now, <clears throat> probably this is a good place to, if you've got any questions uh, as we go through of each of those points. Maggie. Uh, some people I've heard say that it's not quite three days, that it may have been like three periods of time that it created any Look, the three days may not have been, like the three days as we don't know. Okay. Uh, so, some, some people claim that uh, uh, because there's a scripture that says, uh, uh, f you know, in God, uh, a day is like a thousand years, yeah. um, that therefore the, the, the six days of creation could be just six, 6,000 years of creation. Uh, the problem with it, th th there's two problems with that. The first problem is that the word in Genesis actually means a 24-hour period. So all the Jewish scholars agree that when it says that this one 24-hour period, this second 24-hour period, this third 24-hour period, that it really does mean 24 hours and not a thousand. The second thing is, uh, what's the difference between God creating supernaturally life in six days or six, year, six years or 6,000 years compared to what evolution says is 4.5 billion years. You know, a miracle's a miracle. It, it, it won't make any difference whether we make it six days or six months or six years. It won't make any difference. So, um, um, you know, I know that that's what that it said, and I used to believe that too, that particular thing, that, um, that uh, the Bible must obviously mean 6,000 years for creation because, uh, you know, I believed in evolution, and so I believed in thousands of millions of years. So trying to, con trying to integrate my theology with my science background <clears throat> meant I had, to, I had to fudge it. I don't believe it now. I believe that God created, uh, the, the, created uh, everything in six 24-hour periods. That's what I believe now. <laughs> Exactly. Why? Why bother? I mean, it's not like God. I mean, God said, "Let there be light," and there was light yeah. instantaneously. Why would God have to fool around uh, over six thousand years to create, you know, the world? You know. He's going to create it almost as, as, as instantly as he created the lights in the heavenlies when he said, let there be light, and there was. Well, I believe the dinosaurs were around when we were around. I mean, there's two scriptures in the Old Testament that quite clearly talk about dinosaurs. I mean, there's Levithian and Behemoth. And you read the description of both of those, and they sound exactly like we describe a dinosaur today. You know? So, uh, uh, but um, rationalists will come up with all kinds of descriptions 
of why it must have been a hippopotamus. You know, a hippopotamus with a tail like a, a cedar tree. You know, I mean, come on, you know, I mean, for real. I mean, this is the problem, you see. We've been so indoctrinated in certain ways of thinking. I've got to do that too. Let's talk to somebody about this heating system, or lack thereof. Um, we have been so indoctrinated into thinking that evolution is true, we just assume that it's true, and then uh, because that's so ingrained in us, when somebody comes along and says, no, no, it's not true, uh, you know, the, the head just can't get around the fact that this might, you know, that evolution might be false, so we have to fudge it. We come up with these ideas. No, no, uh, Behemoth was actually a hippopotamus, you know? No, that sounds good until you read the description, you know? Or Levithian, whatever, the, whichever one that had the big tail, you know, in the description. You know, uh, a tail like a cedar tree. Now, since when do you know of a hot hippopotamus that's got a tail like a cedar tree? I mean, you know, it's just, it's ludicrous. But you'll read in some translations that these things, these dinosaurs, were translated into hippopotamus or crocodile or something like that, you know, because no one wants to admit that those things lived during human, human beings' lifetime. You know? And we'll look at more at that in a little bit. Now, I know the Big Bang Theory is... Uh, um, there will be an aspect here in, in, um, in evolutionary thinking where it, it just won't add up without some sort of intelligent design. You know, take the Big Bang, okay? The scientists say that the Big Bang happened, that is, we had this... this uh, this uh, point in space that, that basically contained the whole universe, the essence of the whole universe, okay? And it exploded. And because of quantum mechanics, we can explain how something, uh, you know, how something that's, that's almost invisible can turn into the whole visible universe. Quantum mechanics can't explain that through its, its laws. But what it can't explain is what was before the Big Bang. Now, quantum mechanics says, well, uh, we don't really need to consider that because, uh, you know, um, you know it, it just came into existence and then the Big Bang happened. But the problem is this. The physical laws that it took to make the Big Bang work had to be in existence before the Big Bang happened. So how did the laws get there? You know, even if there was nothing, even if there was no substance, no materialistic substance or no energy there, you still had to have the laws to make the whole thing, the whole process happen. So where did the law come from? See? So somewhere in the explanation, no matter how hard they try to, to factor God out of it, somewhere there's going to be this, there has to be this information source that evolution doesn't have. They just don't have it. The Big Bang, I presume you're saying, is an explosion. Yes. The Earth, the Sun, the Moon are aligned in such a way where, I don't understand a lot about it anyway, but gravitation means that we can stay there and not move. How can a Big Bang organize in such a way that the Earth stays up there without falling or, or whatever? I mean, how can it align um, the Earth, the Sun, the Moon in such a way that we can, that we can live, we can survive? Okay, but once, you know, that, that's not a problem to the, the, their theory. You know, once you have the physical laws of the universe, such as gravity and so on, then, then uh, the way the orbit of the moon happens and so on, we understand how it works today. What we don't understand is how it got that way. That's what I'm saying, with the explosion, how could an explosion put it in such a precise way for it to work the way it does today? No, well, well, that, well, that, well, I understand what you're saying, and, and Phil, there, there actually is a very good argument in what you're saying, in the fact that we don't know of any explosions that happen where more order comes from the explosion disorder. than disorder. Whenever we have an explosion, there's always more disorder than order. And yet, for evolution to be true, they have to make more order out of the universe after the explosion. You know, it's not, you know, it doesn't make sense based on our own physical observations of what happens when, ex when things explode. 
So I take your point, and that's a valid point. Okay, let's go on to number two. All the different types of living things we have today were created by God on days three to six of creation. Okay, that's the creation standpoint. Uh, we're not, at the moment, we're not considering the theist point, point of view, which is that God is real and started life and started these processes, and then God sort of like uh, withdrew and let evolution take over. Okay? We're not looking at the compromise position. We're looking at the hardcore extreme positions here, okay? Creation, young earth creation in six days, and evolution over long periods of time. Okay, at number two under evolution, life began with one-celled creatures developing from a soup of chemicals. Okay, so the claim of evolution is this. We had these soups of, soup of chemicals in the primordial earth uh, through volcanic activity and everything else, and then um, perhaps through a lightning strike or whatever, uh, some of those chemicals were transformed into a living thing. Say, because, you know, they have to come up with some sort of magic thing here in order to get life started. So once we've got life started, there's no problem. The big problem is how do you get life started in their model? Now, we just say, well, God did it. Say, so we don't have to explain it. Uh, but they have to come up with some sort of solution. You know? Um, now, uh, some, some, uh, some um, evolutionists themselves have worked out the probability of this happening and have figured out that it can't work. So they've had to come up with another model, and that is life already existed somewhere else in the Earth, in, in, the, in the universe, and life somehow got to Earth. So whether, the, whether you're a far-out sort of person that said aliens landed, uh, you know, uh, chariots of, uh, what was the, the book? Um, Chariots of the gods, chariots of the gods, you know, uh, alien, you know, uh, DNA was sent to Earth, uh, or whether you believe that a, a meteorite hit Mars and Mars was actually uh, had life on it, and then some of that flew off, and those rocks landed on Earth uh, and started life here. I mean, these are the these are the fantastic things they're having to come up with, because they've got the problem: how do you make living things from non-living? Now, no one's ever done it. Most of us would say it's impossible. But evolutionists claim it's fact. Okay? Which is total rubbish. Well, it's just an infinite regress in terms of getting it from somewhere else in the universe. Because it's, got to, it's still got to start somewhere. Well, that's right. Exactly. Even when it started on Mars, how did it get to Mars? So, you know, we're not any closer. We're not any closer to uh, a solution here, uh, you know, they have to assume that somehow uh, life got started somewhere from non-life into life. Now, we know how complicated life is, you know. I mean, evolution made sense to me maybe 30 years ago, but I tell you what, it's getting harder. It's actually getting harder and harder and harder and harder to believe in evolution now, because we used to think cells were pr pretty primitive things, they just had a cell wall, and you had a whole bunch of stuff inside, and you know, and you know, any idiot can put together a cell. But as we've looked at under microscopes and things, the cell, a single cell, is getting more and more and more complicated. You know, every day it's more complicated. You know, um, you know, they, they found out that one part of a cell, for example, uh, only reproduces in humans from the female. And so, uh, and so the scientists came up with the idea there had to be a first Eve. There had to be a first Eve in order for this all to get passed on. Yeah. So, you know, there goes another the uh, their theories out the window, you know. They're actually proving that Eve existed. Yeah. So the more we investigate the cells, the harder it is to... But the problem is the mindset is so blinded that they'll, you know, they'll swallow a whole horse and hippopotamus and behemoth and everything in order to make their theory work. Yeah, but I can remember when I was an old Christian that it seemed the other way around, that it's so hard to believe creationism. Well, sure, of course it does. But I'll tell you what, as you'll see, uh, the evidence that we have that you can look around you in the universe with uh, fits creationism model a whole lot better than it does evolution. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. 
So anyways, number two under evolution, life began with one-celled creatures. They developed, so this one cell got developed um, from non-living material. And then once this cell developed, and miraculously it had the, the means in it already to reproduce itself, which is absolutely incredible, by sheer happenstance, sheer randomness, uh, this cell uh, uh, created a, a mechanism to reproduce itself, then it reproduced itself, then it mutated, then it became more than one cell. Various cells, uh, you know, congregated together and formed primitive multi-cell uh, organisms, uh, and so on. Evolution started out, and basically the ultimate product, human beings, came essentially from one-cell creatures. We all, ev uh, human beings, evolved from slime. Okay, and some scientists, some scientists think the most primitive slime kinds of single-cell creatures are the ones that live in off the West Australian coast. So Australia was discovered. Hey, you know, yeah. well that's it. Okay, let's go on. Number three, creation says that each type of animal or plant was created true to its form in the first place, so that cats are gonna have cats for kittens and. You know, dogs are going to have puppies, and you know, oranges are still going to have oranges are going to come from orange trees, and human beings from human beings. And this is all providing human intervention because you get involved. Because well, when you get the crossbreeds. Well, we'll have a look at that, Phil, because that's actually something we'll be talking about. Okay, number three, evolution. Plants and animals developed from single cell creatures over millions of years. Okay, so evolutionary theory says that, uh, as I said before, that, uh, you know, we had these single-celled creatures. Uh, we, we, you know, they, have, they assume that the single-celled creatures became multi-celled, then probably became some sort of fish or sponge, slime, sponge, fish. Fish then became an amphibian, amphibian became a reptile, reptile became mammals, mammals produced human beings. So, what we have here is the progression from from uh, uh, primi fairly primitive chemicals into incredibly complex human beings, you know. And their idea is uh, that uh, this, if you give, uh, give it enough time, it will happen. But the increase in the amount of information it takes to make a human being is just enormous. You know? I mean, uh, um, I, I think it said something like, that the amount of information that's in a, you know, in a strand of human DNA uh, would like uh, have more, le more words in it than every book ever written on the whole planet, ever. All the libraries of the world combined, all the books that ever existed combined, and still wouldn't have as much information as what one human being's got. Okay? So, uh, you know, so, you know, the, 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 the illogicalness of it is similar to, um, you know, a, a whirlwind coming into a junkyard and, and having enough time to whack together this watch that works. You know, little bits just kick together. Of course, 99.99999% of the little things that fly together never work, but by accident, you know, small gears fly together and we have a working watch that works. Well, I don't know about you, but that's pretty far-fetched, isn't it? You know? It's pretty far-fetched. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that, but you're right. I mean, there's no evidence for any of this. This is all supposition, no evidence whatsoever. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll answer that, June, because you're, you're just a little ahead of me. We'll talk about that in a minute. Going through evolution, as in from the slime to the sponge to the fish, fish oil, et cetera, et cetera, that means that when we, as humans, now reproduce, what's the chance of us reproducing fish anyway? I mean, we go forward. Why can't we go backward in the evolution process? Well, in science fiction, they do. <laughs> In science fiction, yeah. fiction, they do. Okay, let's go on. Um, creation number four. Original kinds of animals had a large gene pool, 
So what creation says is, for example, the original wolf that was created in Genesis had a large capacity for change. Okay? So the, 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 the wolf had the instructions to make big noses and short noses and fat noses and stout noses, okay, on dogs. Right? So we've got this wolf that has a, a rich uh, inheritance and has lots of flexibility in it. And then what happens then is, uh, is we can take the wolf and we actually have records of this. We've got records of how we've bred dogs. You know, over human history, we've got records of a lot of the dogs that have been produced. We know when the breed started and what they used to get the breed and so on. So as, the, as we take this original dog type, and we breed it, we can select the gene so that some dogs have short noses and some have long noses. Now within the wolf, within the original dog, the information was there for long and short noses. But once I, once I breed a dog that's only got short noses, guess what? It doesn't have the information anymore to, to produce long noses. You see? So, you know, if you've got a pug, you can't, I don't care how long you breed pugs, you'll never get a wolf out of it. But if you take a wolf and you breed it over, over generations, you can get a pug. You with me? The information gets lost as you breed and separate, as you select out. Okay. Now, um, evolution, though, said what? Well, the original creature had a small gene pool. I mean, we start off with a, a single cell, you know, that doesn't have any noses for dogs whatsoever. And now it has to find that information, has to build that information to be able to have dogs that have got big noses. You know, how is this supposed to happen? Well, they say, of course, through multiple mutations, 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 over long, 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 long period, eventually you can get pugs or, or wolves. Okay, let's keep going. And number five, the Earth is only six to 10,000 years old. Many dating systems support the young Earth. And we'll look at that appendix later on. We'll keep going for the moment. Um, now, when I say may, many dating systems support a young Earth, there's all kinds of things we know, uh, processes that have occurred around the Earth, like making coal, or, uh, or, or the mountains being washed in the sea through erosion, or the um, amount of salt that's in the sea through evaporation, as more and more salt gets put in from the land. You know, water from the Murray River collects the salt from the Murray uh, Darling Basin, it goes into the Gulf at, at near Adelaide, and it's adding more salt into the ocean, so we can look at how much salt is in the ocean, it gives us some idea of when the, this whole process started. Okay? Or how tall a mountain is, and the mountain washes down, and gets smaller and smaller, and erodes into the ocean. Or we can uh, bore holes into old trees, we can pull out the, uh, the, the rings, and we can count the rings and say, well, you know, this is how many years this tree's been around, and who knows how much you know, earlier than that. So there's all kinds of dating systems. It's not just radioactivity, which the evolutionists use. And many of those dating systems actually prove there's a young Earth. Now, the evolutionists like to ignore that information because it doesn't suit, of course, their model. So you don't hear a whole lot about this other sort of stuff. How much dust there was on the moon, for example. You know, they, uh, NASA planned. My dad was actually part of this. My dad uh, helped invent one of the things that went to the moon as an engineer. And and they planned that when they first went to the moon, evolution said that the the dust on the moon should be meters thick. So of course they planned the 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 landing module had to have these big legs these big uh, saucer-shaped things, so when it landed on the, the dust, it wouldn't just sink through all the dust. Well, when they got there, it was only like an inch thick dust, hard rock underneath. Why, you know, why the difference? 
And then, of course, the evolutionists quickly scrambled, had to readjust all their theories to explain why there's all this moon dust there. And they've got a, a plausible explanation now. You know? But they, you could have flattened them, you know, because at, at that moment in time when they landed and they found out there, wasn't, there was only very little moon dust, that would have fit nicely with the creation model of six to 10,000 years. Would have fit perfectly. And creationists actually use that as, a, as an illustration of, you know, of young, the young universe until the secular uh, you know, uh, evolutionists quickly scrambled, rejigged all their theories to explain all the dust. And it's a plausible thing, so we don't use that one anymore. Okay? Let's go on. Uh, evolution says the Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. Seems to be getting older all the time. Uh, radioactive dating systems support old Earth. Um, some of the radioactive dating systems support an old Earth. But the problem is, and this is easily proved, you can read about it in some of these books, I can, I can use one dating system that says the Earth is only 6,000 years old, and I can use another radioactive dating system that says the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and for, the, for, for each of them this, inside their own system, they're valid. So which one are you going to believe? Well, of course, uh, you know, evolutionists uh, picked the long Earth one, and of course, as creationists, we picked the short Earth one. Yeah. So where's the consistency? Then you might be covering this later, but um, uh, understanding the universe as a whole, I mean, light is um, out there, um, suggests that the universe has been around for more than 10,000 years, or am I misinterpreting something? No, well, uh, well, first of all, I don't want to get into the discussion how old the universe is. Because Genesis never talked about that. So I've got no idea how old the universe is. But uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the universe is the same age as the Earth. You know, but I don't know. I can't, you know, we, we, the Bible hasn't given us any information on that, so I don't really want to go down that track. Well, see, the assumption the assumption is that the, the, is the, it's the assumption for them to arrive at these astounding dates is that the processes are uniform. Okay, so if something took six years to produce today, thousands of years ago, it took six days to produce. Okay, so they have to assume that the processes are uniform. But we actually know, because we've done experiments, that some of these processes are not uniform. But they choose to ignore that and assume uniform processes. Well, no one was there except for God. That's true. We better keep moving. Number six, new kinds of animals are, the, are only the same creatures with smaller gene pools, thus different features. So I just talked about dogs. You see how that works? Any questions on that? Okay. As we breed out individual characteristics, the new breeds don't have all the characteristics of the breed that they were derived from. Okay. Now... Over on number six, evolution says new kinds of animals start by mutation and take over a niche in the ecosystem by natural selection, and uh, they never explain how, the, how there's an increase in, in, in the gene pool. All they say is a mutation caused a new species to develop. Okay? Now, the mutation has to increase the complexity. But we know physical fact that most mutations actually are, are, are dead-end things. I mean, they're deformities, and they don't go anywhere. They're not beneficial, you know. And, and, and as far as I know, no one's ever shown that a mutation increased the amount of information. You know, if one of my genes is damaged, it's a busted gene. Now, how do I get more information out of a broken gene? 
thing. That gene's useless now. So it, it, it's actually taken out of the equation and my gene pool shrunk. Okay, let's keep going. Number seven, most fossils developed when living things were suddenly covered by Noah's flood, in other words, in the same time, roughly the same time, in the Great Flood, fossils are in different places in the strata, in the rock strata, due to the buoyancy or size selection. If I've got a river, it's coming into, and we, we, you can look in, the, in, in dams. Like if you go to the Marunda Dam, and you take all the water out of the Marunda Dam, you'll see there's a selection of, 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 of grain sizes. As the water washes in, depending on the wind and the wave action, it sifts it out. And big grains will be in one place, and small grains will be elsewhere, and silt will be elsewhere. There's a selection going on within the same time frame. Okay? Now, evolution says that fossils are laid down in sequence. The oldest fossils are furthest down in the rock, and the youngest are near the surface. And so they explain the differential here as being different time frames. Okay? So, if, uh, you know, just to repeat, on an evolutionist point of view, the, the creature that's furthest down in the rock is the oldest, generally speaking, and the creature that's highest up in the rock strata is the youngest, because they say there's millions of years between those two. What evolutionists say is, the, the, all those layers of rocks were created at the same time through differentiation, and the creature at the top and the bottom of that section lived at the same time. But you know, the one carcass floated up to the surface, the other one was, further, was more dense and, fell, and, and, and went to the bottom of that, and, and then as different layers got washed in because this flood's moving stuff around, different creatures got put in different layers. Okay? Uh, number eight, rock forms quickly. Creation says that rock forms fairly quickly, and we'll look at that a little bit more in a minute. And evolution says rock forms incredibly slowly. Number nine, uh, fewer species today, fl flood killed many. So God had all these different kinds to start with, so the earth would have been incredibly rich. You know, we would have had 10, 20, 30 times as many types of creatures on the earth that we got now, but Noah's flood wiped out a whole bunch of them. Okay, and the most important ones uh, Noah saved, as God told him to. And of course, other species died out just because their ecosystems were destroyed. Number nine, uh, evolution has to say, even though they don't like putting it this way because it makes them look stupid, but their whole system has to say this, that more species should be developing all the time. We should be seeing more and more species developing all, over time. So there should be few creatures to start with, and there should be stacks of them now. But you know what the record shows? That there's stacks more creatures that are fossils than we have today. Now, something's not adding up here, people. Okay, let's keep going. Number 10, the universe is controlled by God, but probably is running down. That is, unless God's putting outside energy into this closed system somehow, if you wind up a, a clock where you, you're providing the energy for winding it, the clock spring is going to wind down and it's going to stop. Okay? So you have to have outside energy to wind the spring up. Now, if that doesn't exist, the clock only, only can wind down. It can't do anything else. All right, so we're assuming that if the universe is a closed system and God's not putting extra in, then everything's winding down. But evolution is saying that the universe is becoming more complex. Remember, we start with a big band with the singularity, which is this uh, incredibly dense thing that's... Uh, a tiny speck, smaller than you could see, and it exploded and created the galaxies in the universe. Okay? And everything's getting more complicated all the time, and things are coalescing, and new stars are being born. More complexity, not less. Now, what evidence do we see that the universe, our, our immediate universe, is getting more complex? 
I don't know about you, but we're always, uh, uh, everybody's trying to get money out of us for the World Wildlife Fund to save this or that species because everything's shrinking. Everything's getting less diverse. Everything's getting smaller. Everything's getting more chaotic. Okay, observable facts. Now let's just look at what you and I can actually look at. Okay, and see how it compares with the two, with the two, uh, with the chart. Number one, no one has ever found an intermediate living or fossil form between two taxonomic groups. Taxonomic groups are biological groups. You remember your high school biology. You know, phylum is the, is the biggest group, and then we work our way down. So between phyla, classes, orders, or families. In other words, all of those major divisions of animals none of, and plants, none of them can interbreed. Yeah? There's nowhere, uh, nowhere that we've ever discovered where a lobster interbreeds with a dog. No such animal. It's never happened. No one, uh, even the evolutionists, you know, get embarrassed if you ask them something like that. Well, show me where two phylum have interbred, you know. Show me where two classes have interbred, you know. They got nothing. Number two. All so-called new animals can interbreed with similar species, so are not new biblical kinds. See, I can, I can, I can crossbreed a Doberman, Pinscher, uh, with a with a Mastiff, you know, or a Dachshund with a Poodle or something. You know, I mean, if I can breed them together, they're only one kind, aren't they? I mean, I can't interbreed. No one's ever bred interbred, as far as I know. A dog with a cat, built by man to try to be able to plug, to make some sort of uh, uh, order out of the complexity of biology out there. We've created these different species, the names of the species, right? The species themselves, God created, but we've created the names for them. And uh, and uh, I remember at one stage, for example, uh, I think it was uh, there was a plant we used to grow out at Hillsville. Uh, it was called a Lassiandra, and then the taxonomist came in and said, no, no, we're not going to call it a Lassiandra anymore. I think that's the right word. Uh, we're going to call it a Tibuchina. So what they did is they removed it from this grouping, because it didn't fit there, and put it over in that grouping. So this is an artificial filing system. Okay? It's an artificial filing system that we've created to make sense of our universe. Now, what I'm trying to say here is that biblical kinds are only defined by this one thing, that they can produce offspring. So if we can get two dogs to mate and produce a, a fertile offspring, they're of the same kind. Now, I don't care how, what labels you put on them. Dogs, wolves, coyotes, doesn't matter what labels you put on them. If I can put a, if I can take a coyote and a wolf and I can mate them and they have the same, and, and they have a fertile offspring, that is the same kind. Biblical kind. I mean, the Bible said this after its own kind, this after its own kind. It didn't list a whole bunch of stuff. It only listed a few things. So we need to be fair on the Bible from that point of view. Number three. It always takes more information to build more complex structures, doesn't it? Doesn't it take more information uh, on a blueprint to build a skyscraper than it does to build this table? Well, I would think so. Where does the information come from to develop humans from slime, from algae? Where did all the information come from? Where did the blueprint come from? Now, of course, evolutionists don't like you talking like that. They just say, oh, yeah, all it takes is just lots and lots and lots of time. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, just like uh, I just put uh, a whole bunch of blueprints in a room, let a whirlwind whip around, and after a while you got blueprints for a skyscraper. Oh, yeah, all right, okay. Yeah, I really believe that. <coughs> Number four, no one would ever suggest a complicated thing like a watch formed itself over long periods of time. A human being is much more complicated than the watch. 
Five, no evidence that any living thing has ever developed from non-living material. Not even proteins have been created by natural processes, let alone complex life. We can produce proteins in the laboratory, but out there you can't create the kind of proteins that we need for life. They don't exist in the natural. In fact, if you leave them out there, they break down into simpler chemicals. Okay? Number six, the more we breed dogs, the less genetic information each dog breed has. That's why purebred dogs are subject to so many deformities and infirmities through not enough healthy information. See, when I, when I select out a breed out of the dog type, and I breed it, and I breed it, and I breed it so that it's got really short nose, then what will happen is the information to maybe have a healthy skull that fits the size of the dog is starting to, you know, things don't add up anymore and we're creating these cripples. And Doberman pinchers have a tendency to have too small a skull for their brain mass. So you can get Dobermans that are, get, are very cranky. Yeah. So and I'm using the same breeds, breeding on two Dobermans continually. Continually. In order to get the specific <coughs> style of dog that you're after, it means you're having to eliminate all the other styles. If you want long nose, you breed for long nose, which means you don't want what? Short noses. So you get rid of that information through breeding. Okay, number seven. Many things are alive today that scientists swore were extinct millions of years ago. You know, I remember being thrilled when I bought my first ginkgo tree. You know why? Because scientists had said it had been extinct for millions and millions and millions of years. So I went down to the nursery and I bought me one. Okay? Uh, uh, then you had the colacanth fish, which was supposed to be extinct for millions and millions and millions of years, and then they dredged one up down in uh, Madagascar. Hundreds of specimens now, now around the world in museums. In fact, the local fishermen, it's just like having your, your little whiting, you know? You just throw another colacanth on the barbie. Yeah? Common is fish and chips. The, the Don Pine is, uh, is a fairly recently discovered pine in Australia. Again, uh, it's up uh, somewhere in New South Wales. They don't want to tell you where it is in case some nutcase comes in and chops them down with a chainsaw. But, uh, you know, extinct. Millions and millions and millions of years, this thing. And it's growing up in New South Wales. Now, there's a guy in England, uh, sorry, in Germany, that's got a whole museum... And the museum is, I uh, can't remember the German name, but basically it's, it's, it's the Living Fossil Museum. And what he's done is he's just gone and collected all these plants and animals from all around the world that are living examples of millions, supposedly millions of years fossils. Now this makes the, now, now this makes the problem for the evolutionists. If, if we're trying to create human beings from a single-celled organism, where all this change had to take place, rapid change had to take place to get slime to human beings, why didn't the colacanth change at all over millions of years? Duh. There's a problem here. So they had to come up with all kinds of weird theories that I won't bore you with now to explain while one, like, like crocodiles, never changed over millions of years, but we developed from slime. I mean, it's just nuts. I can't believe I used to believe this nonsense. It's just stupid. Okay, let's keep going. I have to forgive evolutionists. I used to be one. Um, so, number eight. Many plants and animal fossils are of things that live today that appear to have changed little over claimed millions of years. Lots of documentation of that. Uh, nine, many species in some genera interbreed and so are one biblical kind. For example, cattle that are in one genus and bison, which are another genus, you can actually interbreed cattle and buffalo. So they're just one biblical kind. Human beings have put them in two separate groups, you know, but they're actually one biblical kind because they can interbreed and they can reproduce. Number ten, rocks form quickly. Many examples exist from concrete, stalactites, to volcanic rock at Mount St. Helens, you know? I mean, if you think about it, concrete is a rock. Well, how quick can you make a rock? 
you know, you bring your cement mixer in, you pour it in the in a mold, and you know, a couple of hours later, you got a rock. Well, that doesn't take long, does it? Now, I'm not saying that all rocks go that quickly, but I'm just pointing out, you know, we think rocks take a long time. We've been we've been programmed to think that rocks take a long time. Well, there's some rocks that take two hours. Now, I'm not saying that all rocks take two hours to make, obviously, but I'm trying to destroy the bias that we have already. Exactly. Sure, doesn't. Number 11. Fewer species are alive today than are in the fossil record. Many species have become extinct. Scientists acknowledge we're biodiversity poor today. You know, they're, they're, everybody's screaming, you know, save the gene pool, save the gene pool. We're getting poorer and poorer and poorer. And yet, as evolutionists, they're claiming, theoretically, that we're getting richer and richer and richer. Well, which of the two do they really believe in? Well, the practical one is the real one, and that's a creationist point of view. Number 12, entropy in a closed system means the universe has to become disorderly and less complex. Second law of thermodynamics says that in the closed system, everything starts breaking down and winding down and rusting out and becoming simpler. Just how it is. You leave this room overnight, because it's cold outside, this room was going to get colder. We're going to have heat loss. Heat's going to go from here out to the outside air. Okay? Now we know that heat is the energy and cold is the absence of energy. So a minus 273 degrees Celsius is absolute zero. You can't get any colder than 273 below zero. Okay? So all the heat, when we get rid of it, will make, bring us down to absolute zero. So wherever heat is, it'll move to a less, a, a, a lower state of energy. The higher energy will move to the lower energy until it's all equaled out. Number G. Why is evolution such a challenge to Christianity? For evolution to be true, it has to eliminate the concept of God. Evolution is an atheistic theory that doesn't need God for its explanations. If evolutionists can prove that the earth is old, then the Bible's false and there's no God. Having things die before the fall would imply that eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil didn't bring death for the human race, contrary to what Scripture says. It would also imply that Jesus didn't come to defeat the last enemy, death, because God, God called everything very good, and so he would have endorsed death before Adam. See, if death existed before Adam as in millions of years, then why, is it an, why, why did God call his created earth good, and why is death called an enemy, if death existed before Adam? See? Theologically, it doesn't add up. Okay, conclusion and comments. Why is it so difficult for us to believe in young earth creation? Is creating earth in six days more difficult for God than raising Jesus from the dead. <coughs> Miracles are no problem to Jehovah. Okay, any last minute questions? June. Instead of talking about some, um, reading, yes? How does that sound over here? Like? Well, we could, do the, we could do the same. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a breed called Chinese and a breed called... Caucasian and a breed called Asian, you know. So we, you know, we're in a sense we're all breeds of of Noah. You know, after the flood, Noah and his sons reproduced, so we can all trace a lot of us back to those original four couples. So I mean, we're just skin coloring; it's just darker or lighter. That's all. I mean, genetically, we're all human beings. We can interbreed with each other. We're all the same kind. Okay. Well, let me pray for you. And uh, if you've got any questions next, uh, you know, next week, uh, as you digest all this stuff, uh, please do. Did Susan mention the Humanist Manifesto, which is your Appendix A? 
Okay, just turn to Appendix B. Uh, just, uh, it's just a sort of a curiosity thing here. But we have a record in the Bible of all the genealogy, all the way back to Adam. We can trace, the Jews can trace their ancestry all the way back to Adam and Eve. Okay? So here's a, here's a, a, a diagram of the genealogy from Adam. So 4000 BC, I should put BC in there, I didn't do that, but 4000 BC roughly, we've got Adam. 134 years later, Seth was born. And if you go all the way down the column, down to where it says 930, that's how long Adam lived. Okay, let's look at Seth. Now, Seth is the godly line, remember? You had, you had Cain and Abel with the two first sons. Cain's the first, Abel's the second. Cain kills Abel, remember? Cain gets banished. All right? Now, because Abel gets killed, the third son is Seth. And that's now the godly line that leads to Jesus. Because Abel's killed, Cain's no good, Seth's now the godly line. So this is the godly line, okay? Now, Seth uh, has a son called Enos that's 105 years later. When, when Seth's 105 years old, Enos is born. Now, look how long Seth lives, 912 years. Now, just look at those, all those dates before the flood. What do you know about, what can you see about the lifespans of all these people? You know, they're all living in the 900s, aren't they? Except for Enoch, because God took them. That's what the dotted line's for. But they're all around the 900 mark. What happens after the flood? You know, Noah's the only one that lived 950. Everything starts reducing, doesn't it? Till Jacob's 147. How, many, how long do people live today? They live to 147? Nope. Why not? Because our genetic pool is less, we're like interbred dogs that now don't have enough genetic information to keep us healthy. Okay? So the gene pool is reducing people. We're getting more and more sicknesses. We're getting more and more crook backs and, and allergies and skin problems. Not less, more. And you can see this in some interbred areas in various countries uh, uh, where, or, or, or villages, remote villages, where people had to interbreed because they couldn't get mingling with other people. They've always got some sort of village sickness. You know, idiocy, idiocy or, or a club foot or something like that because the, the, the healthy genetic information is missing. You know? Now, of course, what is an evolutionist going to do with this information from this sheet? Well, if it's true what's on this sheet, they're wrong. So what are they going to have to do? Well, they're gonna. That's right. They're gonna say the time periods are different. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's all BS that they lived that long. That uh, it was just Jewish pride, and they were just bragging about how long they lived. You know, they have to come up with some scheme to dis to to discredit this. You know, I believe that God's word is truth. He is not a liar. Do you want to say anything, honey? Okay, well, let me just uh, pray for you then, okay? And you, you ponder this and where it leaves you with regard to humanism and evolution. Remember to forgive them because we don't want to wind up doing the same things they do.